Hey, YCS students, it's Mr. Hackman again, back for another assembly. And uh, you got in the news, you know, that we had to shut the campus down again for the next couple of weeks because of the spike in coronavirus cases that's going on around the, the city. And uh, yeah, it's unfortunate because we've been having just such a, you know, compared to the news we're seeing around the world, things were looking pretty good in Hong Kong and now things have spiked a bit. And so, as you can see, Mr. Hackman is no longer in the office, but I am back at my house and uh, ready for another assembly. So, you know, we're getting ready to have Easter break. And I know for many of us, our travel plans have been squashed. I know uh, my family, we're quite excited about uh, going to Europe for the Easter break, something we've been planning for a few months. And uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to do it now. But, you know, what we're really learning is, any kind of disappointment in that kind of field for many of us, it pales in comparison to some of the real pain that people are experiencing around the world right now. People are losing their jobs, uh, finances are going through the floor, the, the economy is, is tanking in a lot of places around the, the country. I see videos of people really in a lot of need and a lot of help. And so this becomes a, a time where we have, is, and it's something I've shared in previous weeks during the assemblies, this gives us an opportunity to be able to reach out in areas of compassion and um, just looking at the environment around us. How can we bring life and light to those that may be in need um, nearby around us? Um, reaching out to the elderly, those that are most susceptible to the coronavirus, making sure people are not uh, feeling too isolated. We're in a time of social distancing right now. People can feel isolated. And yet, I don't know about you, but I've been getting a lot of humorous things sent to me via social media. And it is encouraging to see that humor is still out there, that there are still laughs, laughs to be had. And uh, when we're going through, it's apparently sometimes when the human race is going through a particularly tough time, um, it really uh, allows us to shine as well and to, to um, you know, kind of dig deep. Anyhow, uh, we got Easter coming up, and I wanted to spend this week and next week looking at Easter and some of the meaning behind it, maybe some things you hadn't considered before. Um, you know, Easter Sunday is the, the holiday. It's probably the most important holiday for Christians, and it is the time where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his, his death on Good Friday, and his subsequent resurrection three days later on uh, Sunday morning. And that's why we, we celebrate this time. And even if you're not a Christian, this is a opportunity to, to look at renewal, resurrection, new life. There's something about this being in springtime when after winter, you see new life coming, you know, the buds on the trees, the flowers bloom. It's a time where things come alive again, naturally. And uh, so there's applications in everyone's life of how do we bring new life maybe after a time of winter. And, you know, we're experiencing a pretty rough winter the last few months and weeks. Um, and I think we could all use a little bit of resurrection, a little bit of sunshine, a little bit of new life, a little bit of, of uh, blossoming flowers in our life, so to speak. Anyhow, Jesus's death on the cross for Christians is what we would see as the ultimate sacrifice. And I want to spend a little few minutes just looking at what is sacrifice and why do we have sacrifice? Because the cultures that we come from, whether you're from the East or from the West, neither one of us has an overt uh, sacrificial system anymore like traditional societies or ancient societies of old. Um, although I will show in a, in a moment how we kind of resurrect that sacrificial system, but it takes a different form and in different ways. But, you know, from earliest times, people, you know, there was no science yet. You, you walk out, you got caveman, cavewoman, they come out and they see in the sun, in the rain, there, there are these forces that are bigger than they are. They don't understand them and they require that sunshine for the crops to grow. They need the rain for the crops to grow. They, they need it to not rain too much, but they need it to rain some. Uh, there's storms, there's heat waves, there's all these things that could suddenly uh, put their whole communities into starvation. 
You know, they didn't have a local 7-Eleven. They didn't have the storage capacities and the, the science that we have today to produce food and to store food. They really much lived day to day and year, year to year by their, their seasonal crops. And so um, acknowledging that there's these forces that are in the universe, they begin to come up with ways of appeasing these forces, so the gods, the, the, the wind, the rain, the sun, these begin to take on godlike qualities. And no matter what culture, when you go back into ancient civilizations, in one form or another, they all developed these sacrificial systems. You can see in the PowerPoint just a couple pictures of different um, cultures and, and the ways they would uh, express their sacrificial system, but essentially is, hey, you know what? I, I have to depend on these forces for um, my livelihood, my community's livelihood, my family's livelihood. And I want to keep these forces happy. And so what can I do? I can um, I'll leave a little grain, you know, I'll leave a, I'll, I'll take a little portion of what I have harvested this year and I will offer it to these gods to show my appreciation and my gratefulness for that. And this system would begin to develop over time. The problem with the altar system, and that's what would happen as you saw from the pictures, they would develop these altars, these points of connection between the divine, these forces and themselves. Here's the problem is, say the next year you have a good harvest. Well, it's like, okay, do I give more this year? Or is, am I expected to, to give even more of a sacrifice because I've gotten yet another bountiful harvest? Or if the weather was bad and the crops died or something went wrong, are these forces angry with me and I didn't give enough and I have to give more? So these alter, the sacrificial system causes a lot of anxiety. This constant question of have I given enough? Am I or my tribe, are we in favor with the universe and gods? and and over time, you start to realize the gods can demand a lot because you can never quite be certain where you stand with the gods. I love the picture there. Probably the universe is against me. It's about this time that the Bible talks about a man named Abraham. And he was living in one of these Mideast cultures, ancient civilizations, way, way back, thousands of years ago. And the Bible says this, that God appears to Abram. And, oh, he wasn't Abraham yet. He was initially called Abram. Later on, God changes his name to Abraham. But he tells Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Essentially, God is preparing. There's, there's this system out there of, of violence and sacrifice that has developed, and we'll go into this in a moment because obviously the sacrificial system goes beyond just harvesting grains. It starts getting into sacrificing animals and then ultimately sacrificing people. This became normative at the time. And so God says to Abram, hey, I want you to come out of this system. I'm going to develop a whole new country, a whole new people around you. And through this people, the world is gonna be blessed. Now, after a while, Abraham has a son, and God says to him, it becomes this test, and he tells him, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Now, it seems peculiar because Abraham starts doing it. And, you, you know, if you put that in the context of us today, we'd go like, you're nuts or we're listening to voices in our head or some kind of weird thing because surely God wouldn't require this. And yet Abraham just goes and begins preparing to do this. The Bible goes through the whole thing. He takes his kid up this mountain and uh, he's kind of deceiving him a little bit because you can't tell him why you're taking him up there. And what's interesting to me is Abraham knew exactly how to do this. And it really kind of testifies the fact that this was part of the system. This is just something the gods require. Occasionally the gods require this, and he's not going to question this. I'm sure he's not happy about it, but this is the system. This is how things operate. God has, though, a different 
test, a different lesson that he's going to show Abraham. Just when Abraham is going to do this horrible, horrible deed, the Bible says that God says, speak suddenly and says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. He says, now I know you fear God because you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked and there was a ram caught in the thicket and he ended up sacrificing the, the uh, ram there instead of his son. Now that, that sounds like this really horrible thing, but understand in the context of the time that they're living in, human sacrifice, like I said, had become normative. Abraham saw this as normative. God begins to step humanity back from that and begin to share with them, hey, you know what? People are valuable. Your son is valuable. God does not require the death of people in order for you to be in favor. This is, this is a lesson that, um, it, it's interesting that the Jewish people, and that's who Abraham is the father of, is, is the, the Jewish people. Uh, the Jewish people get usually uh, attributed to the beginning of monotheism, of a singular God, of one God. But uh, sometimes they forget that they're instrumental in this case of being able to uh, be pivotal in walking humans back from this idea of, of sacrificing humans. Because this is how things have escalated over time, where you can never quite be sure where you're, you're at with the gods. And, and, you know, it escalated from giving grains and giving har part of your harvest to certain to sacrifice animals. And then it would start to go into self-mutilation and, 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 you know, different things that people were be willing to do in order to prove themselves worthy to these forces that they depended on, ultimately leading to human sacrifice. God takes this a step back and he reminds, hey, Abraham, I'm a loving God and you don't provide for me. I provide for you. I am a father. A father provides for his child. You don't provide for me. Now, from that point on, the Judaic law, the Mosaic law begins. And if you're not familiar with that, it's in the Old Testament. And there were 613 laws in that Jewish um, uh, law. And many of them, if you read them, can seem outdated or even silly or cruel by today's standards. Like even that a ram would be provided instead of a son. We'd be thinking today, why do we have to kill an animal? That's ridiculous. That's horrible. That's cruel. But again, God is meeting humanity where they're at. That was so normative to them that sacrificing an animal instead of a human was actually moving in the right direction. God was interested in getting us moved in the right direction. And uh, so some, some of these laws that we read in the Old Testament can seem backward at the time, but for those days, it was very progressive. It was moving us forward. They revealed you could know that we were at peace with God, that you could provide. There was a whole uh, sacrificial system installed that a person knew, hey, if I committed this offense, I could go to the altar and I could have this sacrifice and I know I could leave that altar and know that I was at peace with God and peace with the universe. This was, again, we can look at it, this as a little archaic, but for the time period, it was extremely progressive, look, progressive and forward looking. You know, it's like I've often said, hey, you know what? You go back to your year two work and your year two work really looks a little silly and ridiculous now, but when, it, when you were year one, it was pretty progressive. It was moving in the right direction. And that's really what a lot of this, when you read some of the older sections of the Bible, you see that some of it can be a little outdated, but it was actually moving the human race in a forward progressive direction. So that takes us to, how, Mr. Hagman, what does this got to do with Easter? You're giving us a whole lesson on ancient tribal sacrifices. Moving us forward, we're, we come to the end of sacrifice, or as Jesus is referred to as the last sacrifice. The book of Hebrews in chapter 10 says this, that law that I had just mentioned, those 613 laws, were just a shadow of the good things that were coming, not the realities themselves. So what Hebrews here is acknowledging is 
those laws were a kind of tutor. They were to help get us to a certain place, but that's not where we were supposed to stay. Um, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and burnt offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. See, it's, it's important to know that those sacrifices were designed for you so that you can feel better about what you needed to do. But that wasn't where God wanted us to end up. In fact, he says right here, it was never my intention. <laughs> the last thing God wants is really killing bulls and doing all these weird sacrifices to try to earn favor. When you should know that I'm your father, you're always in my favor. In, in Christ, you are always accepted and loved. You don't have to do anything to, to prove to me that you are worthy of my love. And that's what the sacrificial system done. We were, did, is we were trying to prove to God that we were worthy of his love, attention, favor, and affection. But again, this verse says, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance with the law. Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Mr. Hackman, what does that mean? Setting aside the first to establish the second. He's setting aside those laws. You're done with them now. Jesus is the last sacrifice you need. And that in Christ, you know that there is nothing else you have to do ever to earn favor with God, that you are his child, you are his son and son or daughter, and he loves you just because you exist. And there is no performance that you need to do, no sacrifice that you need to do in order to um, get his favor or love or attention. In Christ, we know that God is pleased with us. We don't have to sacrifice anything to him to make us love us more, the universe to be in our favor. We don't have to live in the anxiety of not knowing if God is on our, on our side. God is on your side. And Christ's sacrifice and resurrection is the proof and the testimony, the Bible says, of that commitment God has to you. But here's the thing, is sacrifice is still alive and well. It takes other forms, as I mentioned earlier. Obviously, in the East, we're always trying to maybe get luck one way or the other. They're trying to get the universe to, to, to bend in our favor. And again, I just want to reiterate, in Christ, we don't have to do that. And Christians are not above this desire to try to sacrifice, even though it takes different forms. Maybe we're not sacrificing a bull or offering like our grain harvest because this is the 21st century. And to be honest, I don't have a grain harvest to offer. So what we try to do is we try to impress God with different things. And I know Christians all the time, if I read my Bible more, if I go to church more, if I give more money to the church or do something like that, then I'll have God's favor. Surely God would be with me. But God's message to us at this Easter time is that he's taking us out of that system. The reason I, I, I spent this time explaining that system to you is because even though we look at those old folks in the old days doing that weird stuff, we still kind of are doing it today. And this Easter message is, is God is taking us out of that system where we feel we have to perform or do something to get the universe on our favor when there's nothing we need to do because God unconditionally loves us. The message of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection is to be at peace. I'm your father, and I will be the one who provides, not you. Going all the way back to Abraham thousands of years ago, when that first seed was planted in Abraham of a different way of organizing society, one of compassion and mercy revolving around an axis of love rather than one of power and manipulation and violence um, revolving on that access of power. So anyhow, um, happy Easter. We're going to have another one next week as well. I hope you enjoy this. I hope you learned something. Um, and I will indicate a question that you can answer, answer in the uh, Google Classroom. And the question I'd like you to answer in Google Classroom is this. Is there something that you find yourself doing 
that you are trying to get God's favor or the universe's favor on your side? Is there, is there something you do? when I mean, you might not call it sacrifice, but my question is, do you sometimes feel you need to get God's favor? Or if you don't believe in God, some kind of luck or something uh, in the universe to go your way? And do you do something in order to get that? If so, can you put that in your Google Classroom and answer that? We can have a chat about it next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Happy Easter. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.